Um, well, first of all, let me say, it's not every day that I like networking. There are days <laughs> that I just think I would rather chop off my arm than have to go to that thing tonight. And I've tried to sort of recognize, you know, you can overdo that stuff. Um, I think that, to me, a lot of it revolves around context. Find a context. It's, a, it's really hard to just walk into a cocktail party and start going around and shaking the hands of all the people in the room. I, mean, I could never be a politician. That just, that just freaks me out that they would go do that. That would be horrible. But I think if you're involved in a charitable organization, if you're involved in a, um, a trade association, a lot of my context came from my work with the Software Publishers Association and now with the National Venture Capital Association, because you have context, you have a reason to meet with people. You know, it depends on the context. And, and I think that for those of you who sort of cringe at the thought of doing that, um, you will find it a lot easier if it's, if it, the smaller the group and the more meaningful the context is to you, I think the easier it is. And build a network over time. It doesn't take, you know, sure I have a huge network, I'm gonna be 50 next year. I mean, that, you know, it took, it took a long time to build that network. Um, I don't think you can expect that you're going to suddenly have this network of, of super important people. I mean, the other thing about it is not all those people were that important when I first met them. You know, it's, they may be important now, but they weren't that important back then. <coughs> Neither was I. I'm probably still not, but you know, I'm working on it. But, you know, it, sometimes it's you meet people in a particular context and you all grow together as a group around that context. And then those relationships become incredibly powerful. They didn't start out that way. What's the um, best advice you can give for managing time? When I got to business school here, there was a, a class taught by um, Michael Ray called Creativity in Business. I don't know if he's still teaching. He wrote a book. I don't know if he's still mm -hmm. teaching around here or anything. Probably not. Um, but he had this interesting class, and one of the elements he taught was you had to spend this week. You almost had to spend a week doing something. And there's this week called Do Only That Which Is Easy, Effortless, and Enjoyable which is a little hard in the context of being a second year student at the business school, frankly. Um, but what I realized, and, and my takeaway from that week, which has stayed with me all this time, is sometimes you're just more in the mood to do certain things than other things. Mm -hmm. And uh, people laugh about my time management, but one of the reasons I don't have a secretary and I do all my own scheduling and all that is, I like to manage around what I feel like doing at different hours of the day, and I like to manage around wardrobe. Like, some days I want to wear sweats all days, and some days I want to do the whole power suit thing. And I don't want to have to change during the day. So, I mean, if I told somebody, like a secretary, hi, you're my new secretary, look, there are suit days and there are sweats days. And on sweats days, I only take these kind of meetings, and on suit days, they'd think I'm, I was crazy, right? But the reality is you can be a lot more efficient when you can group together. Some days I talk on the phone, other days I do big blocks of email. Um, some day, some weeks I travel, sometimes I don't travel. And over time, you get really efficient at sort of figuring out how to group <coughs> things together. Admittedly, the nice thing about being a venture capitalist is people do tend to sort of bend to your schedule. You know, if you were a corporate executive, it would be very hard to say to your boss, oh, today's not a suit day. I can't possibly meet with that customer. <laughs> I'm in sweats today. Um, you know, that wouldn't work very well, but I think that's part of why I picked the job I picked is, is, that, I, is that I do that. I use a lot of technology and I delegate a lot too. I mean, mm -hmm. you can't do, you just can't do all that stuff. And then, and then my husband says, I also just lower my standards. Like, you know, if you come to my house for dinner, it's probably, you know, pizza from round table and a salad, or if it's pasta, you either had to make it or you're going to have to clean it up. So, you know, there were, there were some students here last year, and, and I was speaking in a class, and about seven of them came up after the class, and they said to me, we'd really like to meet with you again. We really want to explore some issues, and they were really nice about it. And they said, can we take you to dinner? I said, I don't really like going out to dinner. I like being around my kids, but if you want to bring Chinese food over to my house and clean up after yourselves, you can do that. And so we did that, and it was really fun. So I think there are ways you can, you sort of, you sort of make things work and you kind of get creative about how you manage your own time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, at the end of the day, th the bottom line too is to prioritize. There are just times you have to say no. And that's the hardest thing for me to do. It's that student on a Sunday who wants 15 minutes. You know, you just can't do that for every student who contacts you. And that is, that's the hardest thing. I mean, if I could do that all day, that's super fun, but mm -hmm. that isn't, I just can only have so much time for those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. So that's a good segue into this next question, which says, why do you spend so much time emailing entrepreneurs whose business plans you're outright rejecting, considering you've little to gain from those interactions and little time to maintain more productive relationships? Um, 
Well, first of all, uh, you never know which one's going to be productive or not productive. And I think that's one of the beauties and challenges about this environment that we live in is that anyone might be a great entrepreneur. They might be a great entrepreneur today. They might be a great entrepreneur three years from now. You know, I joke about this. If Sergey and Larry had, like, come to me, I would have said, search, it's already been done, you know. <laughs> I'm not going to go there. If, you know, if the, I can't remember the Facebook guy's name, you guys, whoever is, you know, oh, shoot, he's a Harvard dropout, you know. He's not, he hasn't even graduated from college yet, you know. <laughs> Are you really going to look at his deal? I mean, the, the thing that's so wonderful is there's a lot of, there are a lot of fabulous entrepreneurs who, who are brand new and who are breaking the rules and making new rules. And I don't know who those people are going to be. So if you have a, if, if you just always have, a, I think, a courteous and professional front to people, people remember that. And again, there are, you know, I emailed some really high-level guy at Google <laughs> a couple of years ago. And I said, it was kind of like a cold call email. I said, I just would really like to meet you and talk to you about what you're doing um, in this space, and it turned out he had been a student at the business school and had come to a time I taught my case. And so again, that fifth, you know, I am like the Catherine McPhee of that, but for him, he was an American Idol watcher, so it was okay. You know, it was like, hey, yeah, I'll take a meeting with you, Heidi. I, I, I remember when you spoke at my class, and you know, that happens sometimes. And so, you know, part of why you do stuff like this or meeting with entrepreneurs is because that is my job, and I am prospecting, and you got to kiss a lot of frogs to find the right thing. And sometimes it's just a goodwill creation that I think comes back and, and you know, c comes back and, and hopefully brings benefit in the future and kind of creates general goodwill. Mm -hmm. There are times you just don't respond. I mean, that, you know, unfortunately, because of the nature of our business, sometimes you turn people down for reasons they don't want to hear. And sometimes it's not in your best interest to tell them. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't have to, you know. I can just say no. I can just say it was a bad day. I mean, I was talking to somebody this morning. I did a podcast this morning. I said, you know, what happens if you just have a meeting with the entrepreneur and you just can't stand the person? Some people can work with people they can't stand. I have a hard time doing that. And so if I find the person annoying and grating and offensive, I'm probably going to turn them down. Am I going to say, I find you annoying? That's why I'm turning you down. I mean, I don't think. Probably not, you know. So sometimes you just say no and you just try to make people go away. And I haven't figured out a perfect way to do that. Yeah, sure, no. I'll probably like this next question, which is, is there a really good way to reject someone? <laughs> yeah, you say, I love this deal, but my partner is just, I can't get it over <laughs> 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 That's the best way. And, uh, and uh, we, we laugh about that because that is sort of, you know, it is a partnership and you do have mm -hmm. team dynamic. Um, so I think the honest, you know, if you value the person, if somebody comes to you and they say, I'm thinking about this idea, I like saying to people, look, there's a hundred of these out there, and you got to tell me why you're different. So I, if, if I can give them constructive advice, and if I feel like the person is listening, then I will go that extra mile, particularly if they're a friend, if they're someone I've done business with before, if they're just starting out, you know, whatever. It's remarkable to me how, how many times people just don't want to hear it. And so if they don't want to hear it, you can kind of sense that. And by the end of the meeting, you just say, hey, you know, don't take offense, but this isn't a deal for me. And I think that's the thing that people also, they don't realize is when you're pitching your deal, it's not like interviewing for a job. When you're interviewing for a job, there's an identified job. They're probably going to interview 15, 20 people, and somebody's going to get that job. When you're pitching a deal, um, you're pitching to a person who looks at 200 deals a year, 300 deals a year, and is going to maybe do one or two or none. They're not compelled to do any if they don't find something that's interesting to them. And there is no defined deadline by which they need to do that deal, if any. So the problem is, I think most people, when they start pitching their ventures, they think it's like interviewing for a job. And you either should get the job or told why you're not getting it or somebody <coughs> should get the job. And maybe you go through 10 interviews before you get a job. In venture, you might pitch 50 or 100 times before you get a VC or never. And you have to be ready for that. And so what I really respect is if I turn somebody down, they email me back and they say, I get it. I really appreciate your time. Could you give me three things I could improve upon? You know, what were the three things that really struck you as bad? The worst thing, there are two bad ways to, to respond to rejection, right? One is to not respond at all. And it's amazing to me how many entrepreneurs, I don't know what it is. You spend, I mean, I'm spending time too. I'm spending six, seven, eight, nine, ten hours trying to get to know the deal. 
and at the end I send him a note and I say, I'm sorry this deal you know, just isn't going to work out for me. At least if someone said, well, I appreciate your time, why, why wouldn't you spend the two seconds to kind of close the loop in a courteous manner? Or they want to come back and argue with you. Well, you're wrong. You're wrong about that. I'm, I'm like, and, and when they do that, you just say, great, I, you know, the last thing in the world the last thing the world needs is for another failed entrepreneur to exist. So I hope I hope you prove me wrong. I hope you out and make a kajillion bazillion dollars and satisfy this market need because I'd be happier. The world would be a happier place if you do than if you don't. But it is. I mean, it is. It, it people people don't like to be rejected. And and unfortunately, in my business, you're saying no 99.5 percent of the time, if not more. Um, I actually find it liberating right now because I'm saying no 100% of the time because I don't, I, I, we've exited our investment period, so I'm not doing any investing. And it's in a really funny way. I'm, I'm trying to stay in the deal flow business, and I get a lot of deal flow. So I say to entrepreneurs, I'm not funding anything right now. If you want to come spend an hour pitching me your deal, I'll listen, and I'll give you my feedback. And, um, and if I think it's worthy of, if I think it would be something I would have done, I'll kick it over to one of my other VC buddies. And, but no guarantees, right? Zero. Mm -hmm. And that's actually been really comforting because I just, there's nothing I can do anyway. Mm -hmm. So I think it's going to get boring after a little while, but right now it's actually kind of fun to just say. And it's interesting to say if somebody says, I just want your feedback, and you say, well, I can't give you any money, but I'll give you my feedback. And then all of a sudden your feedback's not that interesting anymore. Um, but some of them still want your feedback. Mm -hmm. and, and it's been kind of fun. And two of the deals that I've done that for in the last six months both look like they're going to get term sheets from the guys I referred them to. So again, it's like, what, what am I being paid for that? I'm being paid zero. But next year, if and when I either raise a new fund or go out to join another firm, and they say, well, what the hell were you doing the last year where, where you weren't doing any deals? I can say, well, look, these two deals got funded because I made, you know, I helped these entrepreneurs. And so I guess I st I'm still good at finding deals even if I didn't do them myself. Mm -hmm. um. <coughs> This question is, when you started your career uh, early on, like many of us, I imagine you didn't have much to offer senior people. So how do you establish reciprocity with those higher status contacts that tend to be more valuable? It's interesting. This question comes up a lot. And I always find it, it's kind of funny in the way that we all have to start somewhere. And my own belief is everybody's got something to offer. You have to pick the right person you're going to offer to, and you have to figure out what that person needs. And so um, there, are, there are literally people who have traded me. There was a student at the GSB here once a couple years ago who wanted some of my time on something. And he was a personal trainer. And he said, I'll train you. <laughs> and he did. And he, he worked with me for a couple months. And, uh, and the deal was, you know, I would talk if I could while, <laughs> while he was training me. And that worked, you know. Um, there are, you know, again, I, I think it's about context. If you want to get to know somebody, volunteer for a project they care about. You know, almost, in fact, the interesting thing is almost every sort of high-powered person, you know, you go look at the venture capitalists and go look at their bios or go look at the CEOs and look at their bios. They're all on some nonprofit board. They're all on some politi they're politically affiliated. They're all involved with schools or something. Get involved in one of those organizations. It's a great way to meet people and contribute that way. And again, I think that this is the, the thing about you're building an asset over time, and you cannot expect that those pay out the first time you meet somebody. And so you can't meet someone and the next week ask them for something. Um, and you know, I still feel that way. I'm I'm really sensitive about asking people for help. Although you know, I need help too, and I ask people for help. But I always, again, I don't keep a register. I don't have a database of you know who owes me favors versus who do I owe favors to. But I kind of have a general sense of if I'm going to ask somebody for something. There has to be either value in them, even in the request I'm making, or in some collective amount of stuff I've done for them beforehand. Mm -hmm. So I just think, don't limit yourself. Be creative. You know, you can, <laughs> you can walk somebody's dog. You can house sit for them. You can babysit for them. You can do all sorts of crazy things that get you in touch with people. I personally believe the organizing around either a professional organization or a charitable organization and going in and volunteering where that organization has collected people that you're interested in is, is pretty much the best way to do it. So um, a lot of students wanted to know what you thought about the internet no networking sites, and do you use them? And some of them want to know if you'll add them to your yeah. site. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Um, no, I don't. Um, 
I, 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 have, a, I have a pretty funny story of that, actually. I don't remember. I think it was, it wasn't LinkedIn, but it was probably Friendster, where one day I got this thing and it said, Bill Gates has asked you to, you know, to like link up with him or something. So I just delete, you know, I deleted it because I was like, that's so not Bill Gates. Um, <laughs> and then I saw him a few weeks later and I was talking to him and I, and I said something about, oh yeah, you know, I got that email from you. And he, and he goes, God, I know, I can't believe you didn't add me to your network. <laughs> and I said, I said, that was really from you? And he goes, of course it wasn't from me. But I had that moment where I'm like, oh God, I didn't add Bill Gates to my network. But anyway, it wasn't him. He was just pulling my leg. But, um, you know, I think, I think that, I think they're a really interesting phenomenon. And I think they are very um, generationally specific. Mm. And I think that's the challenge is I am, I am really old and old fashioned. And like my kids are like, mom, you don't use text messaging, you don't use IM, you are so email. God, that's so old. Nobody uses email, right? <laughs> but I use email. I don't, I mean, I struggle through texting and, and IMing and all that stuff. It's just not the way I like to operate where my kids do that totally all the time. Um, you know, they have 17 different email addresses. I'm like, I have a hard time remembering two. And so it's just a different, it's a generational thing. And I think things like, you know, for example, LinkedIn, um, I pulled myself off of LinkedIn because the problem is all the favors were only flowing in one direction. And I wasn't using it myself. I just kind of, you know, and maybe I'm just kind of built my network the old fashioned way and just, I've got my life working in that way. And so I use email, I use, you know, I pick up the phone and call people. I find who I need through, go I Google a lot of stuff. So I do use current tools. You know, I'm not using like the telegraph and smoke signals anymore. <laughs> but, but I use the things I'm comfortable with, and it's probably not the same way my kids would do things. And um, I think those sites can be very interesting. I certainly think, you know, on, on, I got to say on the dating front, I have friends who've met their soulmates on, you know, these various sites and have gotten married, and I think it's pretty cool. Um, I don't know about business. My feeling about this stuff is when you get something that's more than two degrees of separation, it's kind of like, who cares? I mean, everybody, in, in fact, my, my nephew argues that everybody is six degrees of separation from everybody else anyway. So it's like, they're, they, in fact, I think they did some study, right, where you can find somebody, you, you know, depending on your connections, you can always find somebody. So I just don't, I think those sites have a lot of, I think they're very interesting. I have not been able to apply them to my own mm -hmm. life uh, because they don't work for me in a business context and I've been married for 17 years, so I missed out on all that. But you know, <laughs> I'll let you know if that changed. <laughs> um, just one question uh, is pretty interesting. Have you ever contacted somebody who wasn't interested in networking with you, but was important for you to develop a relationship with if so, what did you do to try to develop that relationship anyway? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I'm pretty fearless um, about trying to get in touch with people. And, um, and people are remarkably responsive. And I don't know if it's because, you know, in Silicon Valley a little bit, it's because I have enough, you know, brand to my name that I can, you know, I'll, I'll, I sort of, I presume, this is going to sound terribly conceited and I don't mean it this way, Oh, it sounds bad, but I'll say it anyway. I, I can kind of presume that after living in this valley as long as I have and doing all the things I have and being president of the trade and blah, 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 that like, and I have an unusual name, that if people will probably have heard of me. Anybody I want to get in touch with has probably already heard of me. They may not know me, they may not know anything about me, but they've probably seen my name in some context of something. And so a lot of times I just pretend like I already know them. And I just, I don't say, hey, remember that time we spent on the lake or something like that. I mean, I don't, I'm not like that, but, but I'll just send an email and saying, hey, so-and-so, um, I hope you don't mind me contacting you, but I've got to really, I don't start with, you probably don't know me, but I'm blah, blah, blah. I'm going to presume they do know me. If they don't know me, the first thing they're going to do, what's the first thing you do if you get an email from someone you're not sure if you know them or not? You Google them. Well, you can Google me. I have tons of, you know, there's lots of stuff on the web, not all of it that I like, but so they're going to figure out who I am in five seconds, and they're going to determine either they're going to respond to me or not. And sometimes they don't respond. If they don't respond, I try emailing them again. And if they still don't respond, I either give up or I try going through another context. I will almost always use a friend, you know, as a, as a conduit because it's a lot easier to say, hey, you know, Heidi wants to talk to you. If it's, is it okay? But it's just remarkable. I mean, again, the, the beauty of, of today is everyone is so accessible. Mm -hmm. And I... Um, 
Yeah. You can guess people's email addresses, and nine yeah. times out of ten, you're right, right? And so, um, it's pretty easy to get in touch with people. And and again, I'm not a, I'm not like a stalker. If I email <laughs> them and they don't email me back, I drop it, you know. Or if 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 they just say no, that's fine. You know? okay. I'm not afraid. <laughs> So your network is really clearly very strong in Silicon Valley, and some students were interested in with India and China becoming more important in, in tech. Mm -hmm. How have you changed or in, you know enlarged your network outside of Silicon Valley? That's that's an interesting question, and that's a trade-off, and I think that's one that you all have to think about. You know where you are in your careers. Um, I really think that um, I mean clearly the world is is going elsewhere. I don't think that neither Silicon Valley nor America can continue to be sort of the superpower they once were. That said, I think that we will continue, both Silicon Valley and America will continue to play a hugely important role in so many different um, ecosystems and, and, and um, economies and, and markets that from a business perspective, I've sort of said, hey, there's lots of people who are going to be great at specializing in China or India or whatever. People inherently have advantages, like they came from there, they speak the language. I don't have those. And so just like I decided many years ago that I didn't have a technical undergrad degree and therefore I was not going to be an engineer and it was too late for me. And, and to this day, I don't do really deep tech investing because it's just, it's just not there. I'd be a C plus at that, you know, pick people who are A's at that stuff. So I. I try to be very open to um, understanding the implications of, of China, India, mm -hmm. and other countries and their rise. I certainly, every one of my companies does business in those countries, has employees in those countries. But am I suddenly going to, you know, get on the nerd bird and fly over to Shanghai and invest money? No. I mean, I think that would be foolish of me to do that. So I think that, you know, and again, this is very different when you're sitting here and you're, and you're 48 versus when you're sitting out there and you're 28 or younger or older, how, within ra that range, is at this point I'm kind of, I'm pretty baked, right? I am who I am. I've got my strengths. I've got my weaknesses. I've got, I, I, I try to be pretty self-aware about what I like to do and what I don't like to do. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to uproot my family and move to Shanghai. One of my partners did, you know. He's got a Chinese wife and he, he wants his kids to learn to speak Chinese and he moved there. I'm not going to do that. And so I have to figure out how to, how to be uniquely to ex exploit what is what are my competencies to do the things that fit in the environment I want to be in and not necessarily adapt myself to other mm -hmm. places. So if that sounds too insular and old fashioned and you know like I'm throwing in the towel to you guys, I will also say that I have to learn new skills all the time, right? So there are things that I decided I did want to learn. Like a couple of years ago, um, there were some companies I was interested in and they were ad supported models and I really had not been in a business that was ad supported in the past and I thought I got to learn this business. I got to learn about DMAs and CPMs and, and I got to learn about you know um, uh, Arbitron and, and all that stuff so I can speak the language of ad supported models and now I know a lot about ad supported models. So it isn't that I'm saying I don't want to learn anything new or meet anyone new for the rest of my life. But I just think that there are places where you can expand your skill set, and there are other places you can say, I'm only going to be a C player in that. What role do you think gender plays in your networking? Uh, and as it turns out, we actually have some, some information about this, aside from what Heidi may say, in terms of a commentary. Does gender matter? Um, does the fact that you're a woman affect your networking, or does the, um, does the fact that you're a woman affect the way in which you network? I guess I'm struck by the fact <coughs> that when I go look at Heidi's uh, website for Mobius, and I don't know if you can see this very well, but this is the picture of the partnership team. And can you guess which one Heidi is um, <laughs> at Mobius? <laughs> there's, there's only one woman there in that picture. Uh, so she actually works in a field that seems pretty gender concentrated, um, and the concentration not being women. And so as it turns out, Heidi mentioned the case was written by a woman at Harvard named Kathleen McGinn who I knew uh, and contacted, emailed her, and asked her if I could have the original case itself. Um, and when she agreed to give me the original case, I took it and then changed it um, to Howard Roizen uh, and changed the pronouns in the case from she to he and from her to him. And then gave two sections of the same class uh, the same case, except one section 
had the Heidi version of the case, the original, and the other section had the Howard version of the case. And they had no idea that there were two different versions. On the syllabus, it was only listed as Roizen instead of the Heidi Roizen case. And so before class, the students were asked to go online and rate their impressions of Roizen, what they thought of Roizen, uh, before coming to talk about Roizen uh, in class. And they were asked to rate uh, Roizen on a number of different dimensions, some positive dimensions, some negative dimensions, how competent or effective they thought Roizen was, <coughs> and whether or not they liked Roizen, wanted to hire Roizen, would want to work with Roizen, et cetera. So Heidi's seen all this before. But some of the items were, how genuine do you think Roizen is? How humble do you think Roizen is? And how kind do you think Roizen is? And as it turns out, um, these, are, these are wildly statistically significant differences, um, big differences between the Howard version of the case, the students who read the Howard version of the case, and the students who read the Heidi version of the case. And those students who read the Heidi version of the case thought that Heidi was less genuine, less humble, less kind than those students who read the Howard version of the case. And when they responded to items like, how power hungry, how self-promoting, <laughs> how disingenuous do you think Roizen is? The students who read the Heidi version of the case um, gave much stronger responses to that item than the students who read the This is the, the hard version. part about being the subject of a case, by the way. It's like, <laughs> 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 so, I, so I apologize for that. Um, and then the interesting question is, but what about the items assessing competence or effectiveness? Well, here students saw no difference at all, no discernible difference between Heidi and Howard. It wasn't that they thought Heidi was less competent or less effective than Howard. It was just that they didn't like Heidi very much compared to Howard. <laughs> they wouldn't want to hire her, and they certainly wouldn't enjoy working with her compared with Howard. Um, and what really drove these differences uh, tended to be this agentic or assertive uh, personal difference or personality. The more aggressive or assertive they thought Heidi was, the more the students disapproved. In fact, that's where all the action is in these uh, ratings. But when they're, they're seeing Heidi or Howard as less assertive, they don't, gender doesn't really matter. And so one, uh, I think there's a number of questions students probably have, but I'll actually give Heidi a chance to talk about this uh, since um, you know, we planned on having some discussion about it today. Uh, well, one of the interesting things, I don't know if you have the data, but can you show the split between oh, yeah. <laughs> so the male respondents and the female sure. respondents? So this is um, the first question. In fact, there were a few hands that went up, and I'm betting that at least one of those hands wanted to ask this question, which was, did you cut it by rate or sex? And as it turned out, when I emailed Heidi about these results, that was the first thing she emailed back to me was, did you cut it by rate or sex? Um, and I did. I uh, actually should say I did this with a colleague of mine uh, at NYU, Cameron Anderson, the study. And we did cut it by rate or sex. And um, uh, as it turns out, all of the differences um, were driven by one sex uh, who were reading the case. Um, and the other sex really saw no difference between Heidi and Howard whatsoever. They gave the same ratings for both. Um, but all the action was in one sex. So I asked my class, um, there were 90 students, and I asked them, who do you think uh, did all the discriminating or the, the sort of saw the differences between uh, Heidi and Howard? And out of 90 students, 86 of them all said, what do you think? Sure. Uh, they all said it was the women. It was the men. Mm. And now, think about how screwed up that is on so <laughs> many levels. Yeah. Because not only are women obviously the victim of stereotyping in this case, but they're also being blamed for doing the stereotyping they're not doing <laughs> to themselves. <laughs> so that's pretty messed up. <laughs> and I have to admit, Heidi, I should mention the rest of Heidi's email was, did you cut it by rate or sex? It was the women, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I did say that. Yeah. So I was thinking about this case, and I was thinking, when, you re when I read the case, the problem is I'm too close to it. So when I read the case, it's just me. And there, there are things, but there are probably things I do that are very female gender identi and identified, right? Sending cards and flowers and cute stuff like that. And then there are things I probably do that are very male gender identified, like, the, like my comment about, I'll just send an email and, and presume you know me, and if you don't, you'll be too embarrassed to admit you don't know me, and you'll probably respond. That's a very, I think that's a very male thing to do. So what I'm wondering about is, if you read the case and you think it's a male, maybe what you do is you forgive him in, in his aggressive behavior, and you decide that, man, that dude's really in touch with his feminine side. Mm -hmm. You know, he sends flowers or he writes people these nice notes. And isn't that great? And I like that guy because he's like that. Where if you're a man and you read the stuff about, and it's a woman, 
you don't like the fact that a woman is aggressive, that a woman is, you know, and, and I can't remember, you know, because I haven't read the case in a while. I don't, I don't remember how much that comes through, but I'm just wondering if, I don't know, that's, that's this week's theory that sure. I have on this. No, absolutely. There certainly is, um, certainly is a likelihood that uh, a, a man who is viewed as being in touch with his feminine side might be seen positively as a sensitive new age guy. Yeah. <laughs> um, but a woman who acts more assertively maybe incurs some backlash for having violated that feminine gender stereotype. Mm -hmm. Um, and certainly that seems to be what drives this uh, difference. Mm -hmm. um, that even though there's no difference in the content of the case whatsoever, and only a difference in terms of the ascribed sex or the inferred gender, um, you know, the, the differences are pretty I have to admit, I actually thought about it. I've never read the case with Howard, but I think I should, because, you know, like the part where I'm in the bathroom bathing my children, I'm thinking <laughs> Howard would be in a bathroom bathing his children <laughs> with a female friend sitting in the bathroom with a bathroom. <laughs> 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 I mean, ew. The only thing we changed in the case, and no student mentioned that, actually. Uh, and the, the Howard Roizen version is now available from Harvard, because a lot of people are okay, running this cool. uh, in their classes. Um, but the, uh, um, the one that we did change was we did change cheerleader to football player. Okay. Because we weren't sure if yeah, that would, you know, we weren't sure if there yeah. were any issues there. But um, still, the bathing your children in, right. the, yeah. I, I will tell you this. That. This right. has become something funny at home because once in a while, if I have a tough thing at work and I'm talking to my husband about it, he goes, "Yeah, maybe tomorrow you should send Howard." Your doppelganger. You mentioned one point. You like to connect people when you see that there's a mutual. It's beneficial for both parties, and, and that that obviously makes a lot of sense. What do you do when you have? Let's take the following case. You have a friend who comes to you and says. I really want you to put me in touch with one of your contacts who's yeah. clearly not as good of a friend. Yeah. And this person needs to see that person for a job or needs a favor. And then your contact, you know it's going to be a waste of their time. Yeah. Um, but you don't want to tell your friend no. You yeah. don't want to waste your contact's time because next time they're going to not want to see who you're introducing right. them to. How do you deal with that situation? There, there are two ways you deal with that. Um, great question. One way is you tell your friend no. And there are some things I just tell my, you know, there are so many people want me to just, to contact Bill and Melinda Gates about something. And I don't care how good the charity is, I don't care how great the need is, I don't care, I just don't do that. And so I, I will say to friends, hey, you know, my husband's the president of a charity and we don't even ask Bill and Melinda ever for that because one of the, one of the reasons I think I can maintain a friendship with them is because I've set boundaries on, on what I think is appropriate and they get inundated with that kind of stuff, right? Um, so I just say, absolutely not, I don't do it, I don't introduce anyone, and I don't even, um, in fact, there's this kind of funny story about, we were actually selling a comp company to Microsoft last year, last year or the year before, and I was really mad at the way Corp Dev at Microsoft was handling it, and I almost picked up the phone and called Bill about it, but I'm thinking, God, what a way, I'm not going to do that, you know, I'm going to deal with my issues through Microsoft Corp Dev, I'm, I'm I'm really angry about this, but I'm certainly not going to use my friendship with Bill to, um, to call, to, to, to do that. Uh, by the way, something really funny happened. I, I had said it to the CEO, who knows I know Bill, and I was like, oh, I have half a mind to call Bill. I'm so mad about this. And the CEO was like, oh, God, please don't do that. So I was driving up to the city that night, and I realized it was March 31st, right, which meant the next day was April 1st. And um, this CEO, whom I've known for a long time, is a huge joke. He loves to play April Fool's jokes. So I got so excited about this, so I emailed Bill on my sidekick while I was driving, which is probably a bad idea, but I was so excited. And I said, if I sent you an email tonight after midnight and asked, and, and it, it's going to be like a pretend email where I'm going to be really trash and I'm going to send you this email saying I've had five glasses of wine and now I just want to tell you how pissed <laughs> off I am. And I copy the CEO, and luckily Bill knew the CEO they've, they've met in the past. I said, it's a joke. So if I do that, would you just, res if I write you a response, will you respond? And, so, <laughs> and he did. <laughs> so I wrote, <laughs> I wrote this email and it said, you know, we're doing this deal, and you know, your, your guys are just being such jerks, and blah blah blah. And you know, why don't you get your pit bulls off? And you know, the, you know, you should be <laughs> kissing our feet that you know we're saving your ass in this product line because your own team couldn't deliver. And you know, I mean, I wrote this really <laughs> scathing email, and I sent it to him, and I and I sent it to Bill, and I copied the CEO, who so like six o'clock in the morning. I could hardly go to bed. It was like Christmas, you know. So, <laughs> like, so at six o'clock in the morning, the phone rings, and it's um, and I see because the thanks to caller ID, I see it says CEO, and I'm thinking, 
I'm not going to answer that phone. You know, I just don't want to answer that phone. So I know his wife's cell phone number, so I called his wife on her cell phone and I said, I've just done this really horrible thing. <laughs> and, and I'm going to not answer any of my phones. So if you need to reach me, call me on your cell phone because I'm not going to. I said, but could you please call the CFO and let him know I did this? Because literally the deal was supposed to close that day. So she called the CFO who called the biz dev guy at Microsoft and let him in on the joke. So then the biz dev guy called up our CEO and said, I can't believe it. What did you do? I just got a word from Mr. Gates's office that he wants the deal called off. <laughs> and so, so then I had, I had written a response for Bill to send me that just, and because and, and, I've known Bill a long time, I know his writing style, and I was like, God, Heidi, I can't believe you emailed me. This is the stupidest thing in the world. I can't believe you're wasting my time. And we didn't want that company anyway. You know, I'm just trying to do you a favor because I know your returns are so bad after the dot-com bust and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, and, and God, I wish we had implemented that breathalyzer feature in Outlook. Um, <laughs> <laughs> which, I love that line. Unfortunately, that's what tipped CEO off to the fact that it was all fake. But, um, but anyway, I, I really count that as like my greatest April Fool's joke ever. <laughs> and I'm sorry that was way off topic, but I just, I just love that story. But the point is that I even wouldn't have, I never would have contacted Bill on that. I, I believe the first line of defense is I have to defend my relationships. And so you have to learn to say no, and sometimes you just have to say, you know, the strongest thing, and a lot of it has to do with things like that. Would you introduce me to this big powerful person so I can ask them to donate money or do something? And the answer is no, and you know what? I live by the same rule. I don't ask that person for that stuff on my own behalf, and therefore I'm not going to ask them for you. The second thing, though, sometimes you, you know, you, sometimes you get the person who says, hey, I hear there's a job opening at company XYZ, and you're on their board, and I think I'd be a great fit. Would you please make an introduction? And you kind of know they're not a great fit. Sometimes they're a nice person. They're just not the right fit. But you don't want to say, hey, I already know you're not going to get this job. So a lot of times I will send an email to the CEO and I say, I've got to make this introduction. It's the socially correct thing to do. I don't think this person is a fit. Um, you know, that I'm going to send it to you. You're welcome to meet with them, you know, but, it, but I'm not endorsing this candidate. And, you know, that's what you got to do. And, you know, I hear some groans in there, you know. It, <laughs> believe me, I don't go back to that person and say, hey, I put in a big, great word for you and I'm sure you're going to get the job. It's, you know, it's a tepid response. Sure, I'll be happy to send it along. So, um, you know, again, it's, 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 a, it's a big spectrum. And sometimes, sometimes you've got to say, please don't touch this person with a 10-foot pole. You know, and, and, and that happens sometimes with references. I get called for references on people, blind references. And that's one of the most delicate things in the Valley. Believe me, you never put that on an email or on a voicemail or whatever. But, you know, if, if you ever email someone and say, hey, I'm thinking of somebody for a job, and I know they worked for you, um, what can you tell me about them? And the response comes back and says, call me. <laughs> That's usually never good. I mean, it's like, oh, I'm unwilling to say anything in an email. That's usually bad. But, you know, that's a lot of the fabric of what makes this valley work is I can't let someone knowingly hire, you know, some axe murderer if I like that person and I know that person's an axe murderer. So you've got to be very careful about that stuff, though. Hi. Uh, apparently, you seem to tell people what you think. Um, do you sometimes feel like you need to be a hypocrite to actually please people? Yeah, and that was pretty hypocritical, what I just said, wasn't it? <laughs> I mean, again, it sounds I mean, bad to say, yeah, I'll pass your resume true. along when I'm also going around the back door to that person saying, I just don't think this is going to be a fit. Um, and by the way, once in a while, someone gets hired that I didn't think was a fit. So. You know, there's a big difference between a good person's skill set, but they're just not right for this job versus evil person, you know, which, frankly, I try to diminish my contact with those people or I'll, I'll you know, I will say, gee, the, you know, the job's been filled or, you know, every once in a while I have a really hard time with this, but I'm trying to learn to just hit the delete key. One of my partners has this big issue with me because he says I am incapable of not responding. Um, I have to respond. And, and he said, sometimes you just have to hit the delete key. Because he runs this blog, and he has all these readers, and they all respond. And I said, God, how do you keep up with the burden of just having to respond to all those people? He said, I don't. And I have a really hard time, you know, I do. And, and again, it's one of the things that I find the most fascinating about entrepreneurs is when they get an idea very often, they just don't want to go out there and see 
that it's already been done. And so they just go like this and they focus on their thing and you go, <laughs> try Googling the following words and see what comes up. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's sort of, again, it's remarkable that all that data is out there and people don't use it. So you walk a fine line. Well, you talk a lot about networking in the valley here, and I was wondering if you think it's different for people from the East Coast or the Midwest, or if there are those principles apply universally. Um, I think there are different cultures around different industries, and this is the industry I know. So this one, I think, works in a very community kind of social. You know, I think it's interesting that we have such a concentrated number of important companies in the valley and such a place where entrepreneurship is celebrated. Here it's almost inevitable that there's so much networking that goes on in a certain way and it's just such a fabric of the valley to be in, te in the technology business that I think it works a certain way. I think, you know, LA and Hollywood work in a really different way and I've had a little bit of interaction there because I have some projects down there that involve sort of more the movie television type and they're, you know, it's all, nobody does email or if they do, it's like three words long. And it's all about meetings, and it's all about lunches, and it's all about, I mean, it's just very different, right? So, so there is a kind of a different context. Um, and I'm like 25 years too old, and four sizes too big, and I'm not a natural blonde. Of course, there aren't very many natural blondes down there either. But, you know, so it's like, as a woman, I definitely feel, I definitely feel like a big old woman when I go down to LA to do deals, as opposed to here, where it doesn't even cross my mind. You know, I don't think about sort of that um, aspect of, of what I bring to the table. So I do think it is a little bit different. I certainly think in the technology industry, and I do try to meet people outside the valley because I think that one of the exciting things about the technology industry is we do touch so many other industries right now. And so I think in terms of media and entertainment and all of that, you do need to get to know other people. And I do find sometimes the style's a little bit different. but. I think fundamental common human nature and courtesy is sort of the same everywhere. I mean, cult internationally as well. You know, sometimes internationally I've had issues. I, it's not in this case, but one of the other cases, <coughs> there's a story about when I went to Japan in the early 80s to do a contract, and they didn't want to deal with me because they wanted to deal with men, and I wasn't a man, and they wanted to deal with my brother because he was the author of the program, but my brother didn't want to didn't want to travel. And so there were cultural issues that sometimes you say, well, culturally, I just can't win. I should have sent Howard that day. But, you know, sometimes, sometimes, it, sometimes your style doesn't work. And, 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 and again, maybe this sounds kind of old and whatever, but I'm kind of at the point in my life where I like the style of who I am. And not everybody's going to like me, which took me a long time. I had, like, for the first, I don't know how many years of my life, I just thought everyone had to like me. And if you didn't like me, by God, it was going to make you like me. And now I'm kind of like, you know, people aren't going to like me. There are people who are going to say, oh, that woman is a, a ditz, or that woman is annoying, or too social, or whatever. Don't like my hair color. I don't know. And that's okay. Not everybody has to like me. And I think the more true to yourself you are about who you want to be, it's okay if people don't like you. Because if they don't like you, they're probably not the right people for you anyway. The issue is if you if you have a persona that nobody <laughs> likes, you know, at some point that's kind of a problem if you're off by yourself. But you know, for me, it's like you know, my style is definitely not does not work for some people. I'm not sure if you know if I had been if I had transplanted myself to New York and tried to be in the in the banking business, maybe it wouldn't have worked. You know, maybe my style's just too laid back and casual for certain industries. So that's why I ended up. Being in this one. Um, it seems from the case and what you've been talking about today, you've got uh, varying levels of contacts with your friends, and so <coughs> some people you've seen recently and always, and then some people you probably haven't seen for a couple of years. Um, I find it difficult myself, and I'm wondering if you have any tips or tricks that you have to make it less uncomfortable when you re-engage with people that you've either forgotten or, you know, you know they're nice people and you know you want to be involved with them and you see them after three or four years and you're like, God, I don't know your name and I have completely forgotten all about you. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have any tips for either remembering that or how to get through that initial awfulness? Well, I, I mean, the first thing is, is personally, I almost never pick up the phone. It's all on email. And if I'm going to talk to someone on the phone, I schedule a call. Um, because I find that the dialogue on email allows you time to think, it allows you time to research, it allows you 
a different sort of flow of conversation and it allows you to control the interaction a little bit differently than it does on phone. Now again, please temper that. I do have friends, they have my cell phone number, I have their cell phone number, we talk on the phone. But I'm saying in the context of what you're saying, like you run into someone and you say, gosh, I haven't seen you in a couple of years, Let, I'll follow up with you on email. And then I follow up on email and I figure out what the appropriate um, context is. Sometimes there's no context. Sometimes, you know, there's, there's no reason to get together. Sometimes you think, well, that's a really interesting person and even though there's no reason I want to get together and you make time. <laughs> I also think that um, I've gotten pretty good at, at, you know, for example, a friend of mine wrote a book about the iPod, a guy named Stephen Levy, he writes for Newsweek, and he asked me if I would have a party at my house, like a book signing party. So Steve's based in, in, in New York, and I said I'd have this party for him. And so he and I collaborated on the guest list, and there have been, what's been great about that is there have been opportunities for me to invite people that are not necessarily people I'd have over to dinner on a Friday night. I haven't seen them in a couple years, but maybe they're people I used to work with at Apple, or they're people in the music industry, or they're people he and I know from, you know, he used to be a reporter at Mac User a kajillion years ago that we know in common, and it was a great opportunity to reacquaint uh, those people, you know, to, to pull us all together. So there are going to be 80 or 90 people at the house, and maybe 20 of those people are people that I'd say, hey, haven't seen them in a couple years, there's context in this, in this. how much time am I really going to spend with each one of those people? It's a two-hour party, and there are going to be 80 people at my house. But what's interesting about that, and, and this goes to this whole house thing, which is another controversy, you know, I, I, I like to use my house like a conference facility, but people feel different when they come to your house than they feel if you run into them somewhere else. They feel like they have, that it's more personal. And it is more personal, it's your house, for God's sakes, you know. So you do give up a little bit of your, you know, um, your whatever it is, your security or anonymity or whatever when you have people over to your house, but it means I can have a five minute interaction with somebody that's probably gonna be more meaningful than if I ran into them on the street for five minutes. But still, there's only, you know, I have the same issue you guys all have. There's only so many hours in a day. And at the end of the day, you gotta figure out who you're gonna spend time with because either it's important to your work or you just en enjoy it. And you gotta make trade-offs and it's, it's hard to do. Uh, can you talk about some bridges you've burned or some contacts you've jacked up? Yeah. <laughs> I try to not burn any bridges, but I certainly have had some in the past that, you know, there are people that I've decided I'm not going to deal with you anymore. And again, there's the subtle way of just, you know, yeah, we'll get together someday. Oh, I accidentally deleted your email. Oh, my spam filter must have caught that email. And you know, usually people kind of take the hint if you're just unresponsive that you eventually, they go away. and. And I take the hint, if people are unresponsive to me, that I eventually go away. Sometimes you have to specifically say to someone, you know, what you did to me is really wrong. And I don't like the way you behaved in this manner. And frankly, our relationship is over. And I've probably done that outside of dating. <laughs> I've probably done that fewer than 10 times you know, where I've had to literally say to someone, in fact, it's probably fewer than five times, it's probably like three or four times, where I've said to someone, I just don't want to hear from you anymore. And usually it's some really, you know, pretty bad thing. You wanted it to work out, but it didn't. Well, I can tell you one, I can tell you one thing where I, you know, to this day I feel bad about it, there's nothing more I can do about it, but, you know, somebody wrote this pretty nasty book about Steve Jobs a number of years ago, and they quoted me extensively in the book. And I knew the guy who wrote, I knew the guy, and he had interviewed me. And, you know, out of the things I said in the book, 10% of the things are probably things I said that probably weren't that nice, and I wasn't being careful. And 90% are things, there were even really nice things I said that he, twisted around or didn't include or whatever, you know, he had a picture he wanted to paint and he used me. When the book came out, I was completely mortified and I thought, what am I going to do? And what do you do? I called Steve, I apologized, I said, I'm really sorry this happened. You know, the lesson to me is some of those things I actually said, why would I do that? You know, but you know, whatever, I, there were a few things I said that weren't that nice. There were lots of nice things I said they didn't include. I said to Steve, you know, I, I thought it was going to be more balanced, I thought it was going to be fair, I'm really sorry I did this. I'm never doing it again. And um, it was interesting, I was somewhere with his wife 
um, Lorene um, last year at this time, and, and we were away on this big hiking trip. And finally, like on the Friday of the hiking trip, I said to her, you know, it just still really bothers me, and I just want you to know I'm really, I'm really sorry about it, but it's, you know, it's been like five years, and there's nothing, I can't, I can't undo it, right? It happened. And she's like, I can't believe you're even still thinking about that, <laughs> you know, which is it. She's like, forget it. You know, it doesn't matter. It's, you know, we're, we're all over that. But I think it's really interesting that if you do something and it was wrong and you value the person, you know, you apologize, you do whatever you can to make it right, and you make sure it never happens again. And that's the best you can do. If they, can, if they still feel that in their book that puts you in, you know, as I call it with Steve, the land of bozos forever, then you're in the land of bozos forever and you accept that and you move on, you know? So, I don't know. Try not to do it again. Don't talk to the press. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Uh, what's your most fundamental motivation or drive? I mean, what makes you tick? Uh, ooh, that's a great question. I have no idea. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I know what makes me, I don't know. Um, you know, I'd say for a lot of my entrepreneurial career, it was actually fear of failure. Um, I didn't want to be a failure. I wanted to win. I wanted, there were people who didn't think I could do it, and I really wanted to do it. And I think that's kind of a negative, you know, that's a little bit of this beat the other team mentality, but let's face it, it's really compelling to beat the other team. It's really compelling to say, man, those, those VCs who turned me down and those guys out of business school who told me I was nuts for starting my own company. I want to prove them wrong. And that does motivate you. I think that some of the motivation for me, certainly in my entrepreneurial days, was the pride of seeing something great happen, walking down a street in Taiwan and seeing my product in the window or getting a great review or seeing employees, you know, have a, have a, have a great time. I mean, the culture that we built at, at our company, to this day, uh, some of my best friends were the people I worked with there, and they'll say to me, I've never had a work experience like that. It was the best work experience I've ever had. So that drives me. I mean, certainly the, the financial rewards have been great. Um, certainly um, the opportunity to contribute, the opportunity to give back, to engage with really interesting people. Um, all those things are, you know, it, it's interesting. I, I don't think I think about it every day. I mean, I am still in my wage earning years, and I still do need to earn an income if I want to live the lifestyle that I've now accustomed myself to. So I do have to think about compensation. I mean, I don't have the, you know, I don't have the billion dollars in the bank, and I can't just stop doing that. But I said to my husband a couple <coughs> days ago, because I am in a transition now where, you know, we're not going to raise another fund, and I'm thinking about what's next for me. I came home from a board meeting, and I said to him, I must just be twisted, because I'd rather spend a whole day in a stuffy conference room at a board meeting than, like, going to a spa for the day. I mean, not every day, but we had a really great board meeting, and for me, a great board meeting with a lot of interesting things going on where you really go in and tackle problems and contribute and try to help them recruit someone and close a big deal is more fun than going to a spa for a day. So I, I guess that's what works for me. I don't know. Here. Um, reading the case and seeing you here today talk about uh, your life, it's clear you've been very successful in uh, building your career and touching many lives um, um, in the Valley. And I think many of us here are heading out to try and do the same thing, to build our own brands and to touch lives and change organizations. I'm, and I'm sure in that journey, we won't all be successful all the time. Right. And I'm curious to hear your perspective on how you've dealt with setbacks and failures in your life thus far, and what we can take away from that, for that uh, as we go forward. From here. Sure. Great question. And, and, and clearly, you cannot be a venture capitalist in the Valley starting in 99 without having a tremendous amount of failure. So I have a lot of failure that I can, I can draw upon to answer this um, question. Um, I think that, you know, like probably all of you in this room, your successes have outnumbered your failures, and that's why you're here. And when you've had setbacks, you've had to, you know, come out and, and rise above them. And certainly in my career as an entrepreneur, we certainly had setbacks, but somehow it all, we always, you know, I'd say it was sheer tenacity and a great team that got me through those, and we ended up ultimately turning in a success. You know, sold the company, our VCs made money, we made money, we had a great time along the way. Um, then, you know, then I went to Apple, and I think the biggest challenge I had at Apple was that I just couldn't fix it. You know, I, there was not... I didn't have the power or the skill set or the, or the 
resources or whatever it was, I went there and it was overwhelming to me. And after a year of being there, I just said, this is not for me, and I left. And I feel like I did a lot of good things there, but, you know, but again, I didn't take it as a personal failure. I was, okay. I, maybe I was still like coasting on the ego of, of having and run my own company. I was still okay. It was like their fault, not mine. Maybe, I don't know. <coughs> but then venture capital was very challenging because, of course, the first year I was a VC, you know, my first two deals went public and big returns and blah, blah, blah. And then the market crashed and I, you know, you go from everything you, everything you do is golden to everything you do is crap and you spend years digging out of it, and you start to have a real crisis of confidence and say, am I wrong? Am I bad at this? Am I, am I, just, am I just stupid? Um, and I thought about that a lot. And, and when I had that crisis of confidence, what I said is, I believe there are things I'm really good at, and I believe there are things I'm not good at. And in the things I'm not good at, I either have to decide to get good, or I have to build a career that plays on my strengths. And at that time, I had a real crisis of confidence. My deals had all fallen apart. And um, I was lucky in that I had a supportive partnership. And I went to my partners. They wanted me to, they, like, they were like, oh, web services is hot. Why don't you concentrate on web services? And I thought about that. And I struggled. And I looked at the market for six months. And I came back and I said, there's not a single deal I want to do in web services. And it might be because I just think it's not a good market. And it might just be because. I was a creative writing major as an undergrad. You know, web service, it's like a struggle for me to study this stuff. This is not my, um, this is not my thing. And so I decided I was just going to play my strengths. And I said, you know, I really think that I understand the consumer mentality. And, and I also want to look at supply and demand of venture. And at the time, in 2002, nobody was doing pre-revenue deals. And nobody was doing consumer deals. And nobody was doing ad-supported deals because, well, because there was a lot of, you know, there was a lot of you know, blood on the pavement in the valley with all those deals. And there was a lot of, of kind of momentum paralysis. Like, unless you have momentum, I can't do the deal. And so as soon as you're a million a quarter in revenues, I'll look at you. And I thought, well, then I'm competing with all these other VCs. I don't want to do that. So I said, I'm going to play my strengths, and I'm going to go where these other guys aren't. And luckily, my partners were like, hey, that makes sense. You know, you should go do that. And as a result, I did deals like Perpetual and Ecast and Reactrix that you know, that, I, that now, you know, again, they're not liquid yet, so I don't want to count them as victories until they are victories, but they all have had up round financings this year. They're all doing really well. You know, we'll see if it's a cyclical market and we'll see if that works. But I think, you know, anytime you fail, I think that, you know, you need to, you need to, you need to mourn your failure. You need to understand <coughs> why you failed and you need to take whatever lesson you can from that. And at a certain point, you know, like Loreen said to me, you then need to move on. And you then need to sort of say, OK, I failed. I invested a lot of money in a bunch of things that ended up not working. I can either go you know, drown myself, or I can say, well, what did I learn from those failures and go apply it? What strengths do I want to build? Where do I want to focus my energies? And so far, that's worked pretty w well for me. I mean, I think, you know, <laughs> I think some failures are harder to recover from than others. But um, I do find that I cycle back, as a, as, a, as a last point on that. Like, I can agonize over the same mistake for years. And I have found that, you know, you almost have to, it's like meditation. You almost have to say, let it go. You know, I hear, I hear what my mind is saying. Yep, screwed that up. Let it go. Just walk away from that and move on. When you first started your business career, what types of challenges did you face just because you're a woman? And how many of those challenges do you think still exist today? I just think this goes to that fundamental issue of playing your strengths and understanding who you are. And, and I'm female. I was born that way. I'm going to be that way. And when I got to business school here, for example, I said, OK, you know, my class, I don't know what percentage you guys are. We were like 23% were the women. And I was interested in technology, which was, at the time, in 1981 to 83, not a lot of people came here wanting to be in technology. They mostly came to do investment banking and management consulting. And, um, and honestly, I didn't even know what those were when I got here. So, um, so, you know, somebody would come to give a speech. Trip Hawkins would come give a speech. And at the end, there were 10 people who would hover around asking him questions. I was the only woman. <coughs> Tell you what, my questions got answered, because I stood out. and so. Um, I think that, you know, there is a line between using whatever attributes you have, if you're smart or you're a good singer or you're this or you're that, and exploiting your difference. 
and I think that, you know, you got to be very careful. And I think for the women in the group, there are some things about, you know, I think the Howard Heidi case tells you, you are going to get judged differently. I mean, I, I do know a lot of very high-powered women <coughs> in, in many industries who get, you know, who get characterized as a bitch or something, you know, where you think if a guy did this, nobody would, you know, nobody would question why a guy can raise his voice or, or, or say swear words in a meeting. But if a woman says it, it's just completely different. And so you are judged differently. Um, I, I dress differently. I don't put on a business suit. I don't play golf. I don't pee in a urinal. There's all sorts of things where I just don't, I don't do those things. And so I do other things. You know, maybe I cook pasta for everybody. Maybe there are things that work to my favor. Like, like I said earlier, I think that the male CEOs find me less threatening, which means they're actually more comfortable telling me when they're having issues and problems. And if I can help them solve those issues and problems, it's more likely the company's going to be successful. So I do think there are certainly, there have certainly been times when I've walked into a meeting and I've realized there is no way that I'm going to get funded or there is no way that I'm going to get this bank loan because I'm a woman. That as soon as they saw me walk in the door, it was over. And you can, you can fight that and you can do all that or you can just move on because the, the beauty and the glory of entrepreneurship is there's thousands of banks, there's thousands of VCs, there's thousands of people you can deal with. And most of the time, your employees don't care that you're a woman, your customers don't care that you're a woman, they, they care that your product's good, they care that your work environment's good, but actually most people don't care. There are some people who care, and for them there are replacements. And that's just, you know, how it's worked for me. And, and you know, as a, as a tail point to this and, and a good ending point, it's something I think about a lot now because I am now sort of being lumped in with those career women who suddenly don't do the high-powered jobs. You know, people call me up. I, some people have called me up for CEO positions for very high-profile companies, and I say, I don't want to do it because I don't want to do it. <laughs> it's because it's just not that important to me to be on the cover of a magazine or be a CEO or, or, or do that stuff anymore. It's not worth sacrificing my personal life anymore to do those things. And so I spend a lot of time thinking about for the next phase of my career, because I still want to have a career and be gainfully employed. And I, like I said, I like going to board meetings better than spots. So if you're that <coughs> twisted, you better keep working. But you're not going to see me suddenly take a division VP job or a, or a general manager of a big group. Or you'll, you, you will never see me associated with a corporation, at least not while my children are still at home, because I'm just not willing to do that. And I kind of think, does that make me a bad statistic as a woman? You know, am I suddenly a cop out because I'm just yet another woman who's going to be, you know, on the on the side of the great, you know, I'm not going to be on the cover of all these, you know, whatever that magazine that does the 50 most powerful women. I'm just not going to be there. And is that a cop out to all the people who've invested in me to date and the people hope, hoping to raise the female flag and say, you know, whatever? Or is it that I'm so enlightened and liberated that it's okay to make that decision? That you know, I can say, yeah, I could, I could, you know, one career path could have taken me that way, and I could have maybe done that, but I don't want to do it. It's just not important to me, and it's okay to decide you don't want to do that. So my closing comment to all of you guys, and, and I think, you know, it's something I've tried to live, you know, for my career is I try to do what I actually enjoy doing, because I think people are just inherently better at things that are personally fulfilling to them that they enjoy doing that don't compromise their ethics or their morals and that allow them to work with people they care about and enjoy working with. <laughs> and if you're getting up every day and you're not doing that, you should find something else to do because most of your day you do spend working. I mean, they're, they're just, they're, you know, and especially if you're here, you're probably already sort of, you've got that work bit. So my sense of that is, where I've come at this point at, you know, 48.75 years or whatever is I'm just unwilling to do those to do those things that maybe look good on a resume or get you on the cover of a magazine but are counter to the way I want to live my life. And who knows if that's a good decision or not, but at least I'm kind of having fun on a daily basis, which you know, not to get too philosophical here, but you know, that's pretty good just in and of itself. So, anyway, with that um, this was fun. I'm sorry about last week. Thank you.